welcome to the Hoop Collective Podcast. We talk about the NBA, which you're doing on Sunday morning. Jackson is recording this on his way back from a wedding over the weekend somewhere down the East Coast. Yeoman's effort for Jackson. I don't know. He's in a car. He's traveling on 95. He's passing multiple Wawa's. Jackson, amazing work. Joining us from his stationary position in New York City is Tim Bonteps. Hello, Brian. Hoping for another Mets win tonight. I'm not as happy as Jackson, who got to celebrate Juan Soto hitting the ball 10,000 miles against your Cleveland Guardians on Saturday yeah. night. Impressive performance by the Yankees, having not been to the World Series since 2009 is an embarrassment. Joining us from Dallas, Texas, where their Rangers won't be defending their World Series title this year. But Bon, T- but bon Temps' is, uh, Mets could uh, could try to rally for the for the. You no, know it's funny. I legitimately didn't know that the Rangers won the, t- the World Series last year. <laughs> well, that's the end of the year baseball talk on the pod. It's Stan McMahon. <laughs> Howdy, partners! It's uh, it was a tough Saturday night in the McMahon household. <sighs> Texas Longhorns got their little butts handed to them. It's the Oof. first loss of my daughter's career as a football fan. She's. A couple months into her first semester down there. So uh, she experienced a loss for the first time. Was she one of the people throwing bottles on the field? Uh, I confirmed that she was not. And she informed me that the vast majority of those were beer cans and not water bottles. By the way, Uh, that was one of the craziest things I've ever seen watching a game where they call call a pass interference penalty. People throw water bottles on the field. The coach comes over and is like, cut it out. Walks back, and then the refs are like, "Yeah, we messed it up." <laughs> you know what? It, it, it allowed time to reconsider, and it, it certainly. Uh, I was informed that the student section had never been more hyped than when their delay. Yeah, the refs' time to reconsider, and Texas still couldn't take advantage of it because their supposed first round offense tackles got their butts handed to them down after down. But we talked sure about did. the NBA win. We do talk sure, about the NBA. They sure did. I was on the field um, in, you know, I used to cover uh, at some NFL before I did all NBA. And I was on the field um, when that infamous game in Cleveland happened, when the uh, the, the referees got pelted by beer bottles. Uh, Were you really? Yeah, because it was right at the end of the game. And wow. um, uh so the, the, they were just throwing beer bottles. I, I, I mean, they were plastic but they were full and they were and I was basically in the tunnel when the referees came off the field and um the just just rained down on top of them like t- a couple of the refs took some real hits there it was not a it was not a joke I mean it it wasn't a bar fight just to be clear they were being flung at them they you know whatever but um uh it was it was quite a memory uh to say the least um luckily that's uh so they've sort of gotten away from uh, allowing uh, uh, full beer, full beer, beer bottles uh, at uh, NFL games. Um, I'm sure that uh, it didn't ruin your daughter's uh, weekend in Austin, though. I'm sure. I think Austin has been pretty lit this weekend, McMahon. So yeah, I, I think she'll be okay. I, I, I think life will move <laughs> on, especially with the new college playoff system. Horns still have everybody's good- got a loss, yeah, except for Oregon. Everybody's got a loss. All right. So NBA season starts on Tuesday night. We've got a couple of games. Uh, uh, Banner night in uh, Boston. Are you going to Banner night, uh, Bontemps? I will be in Boston for Celtics Knicks on Tuesday. I'll be in Philly for Bucks Sixers on Wednesday, and I'll be in New York for Pacers Knicks on Friday. Wow, okay. what a week! One week what? ahead. He didn't need the whole itinerary. He asked, <laughs> just, he asked no questions. Just, just saying the week. It's a fun. What's week your week having? looking like, McMahon? What do you got? Because uh, you want to give, give out flight numbers. You want to tell? No, them? I just I just say where I'm going to be. Yeah. Brian's going to be in Wisconsin, either Omaha or LA. We know that. I will be on the couch Tuesday. I will be on the couch Wednesday. <laughs> <laughs> I will be at uh, at Spurs at Mans on Thursday. I'll be on a flight Friday. Let me look up my flight number. And then I'll see <laughs> Mads at Suns on Saturday. Oh, look that's at that. A, that's a fun that's, that's a fun an interesting game. Games. Yeah, I'm glad I'm glad I heard that. I didn't know that was coming. Uh yeah, so um I'm going to LA. Lakers uh, open on Tuesday against the Wolves. Will that be the Bronny LeBron night? We'll see. Um Bronny has not had a tremendously impressive <laughs> preseason. Um oh, but I uh, certainly Hey, Bronny had a big game the other night. They just got blown out by like 70. Yeah, well, 
before that, it was rough. Um, uh, then uh, Wednesday is the opening of the Intuit Dome, the official opening. I know they've had some games there, but the official opening. And I think we've got some special stuff on ESPN around that. I don't want to get out over my skis on what's going to happen there, but I'm planning on being at the Intuit Dome on Wednesday for the first game. All so, right. Who do I they was, have on Wednesday? Oops, sorry. I'm the, looking up. the Sons of Phoenix. Oh. Uh, will open the Intuit Dome officially. So um, the Suns with uh, Lakers, uh, apparently lots of Suns uh, action. We're going to be all over the Suns. Uh, Suns, Lakers, Suns, Clippers, and um, uh, Suns, Suns Mavs. Mavs all in the first yeah. week here. I, I hope I can step on your turf by seeing the Suns. I know nobody's higher on the Suns than... <laughs> <laughs> well, I actually, I actually went to no Suns games last year. After I had to file taxes in Arizona the previous two years, I did not somehow see the Suns last year while I was defending their chances for months on end and then, you know, having to tuck my tail uh, at some point. Um, you, didn't, you didn't go to any of their four playoff games? <laughs> I didn't make it. <laughs> didn't make it. Didn't make it to the second round where I thought I might see him. Uh, so, yeah. Um, all right. Well, as we get ready to start the season, we're going to take a – a little look at what we think is going to happen in the award voting. This is one of those things that um, on one hand is a little bit laughable to talk about the awards um, in October. On the other hand, we see year after year after year where the awards voting gets framed before Christmas. Um, the MVP race is in a lot of ways a narrative race um, and the narratives tend to form their themselves early in the season. And so while it is kind of ridiculous to talk about it now, it's not um, irrelevant. And so what's what we're going to do here and discuss the sort of major awards we see coming. Giving and people will, a lot of incentive to keep listening to the podcast. Well, <laughs> and it's, I mean, this our, is a ridiculous discussion, but we're going to have it. <laughs> well, but I'll say if you're listening to the podcast in the middle of the NFL and uh, NCAA football and uh, baseball playoffs, you're a hardcore uh, who collect listeners, so we appreciate you. Also, if you got through our baseball analysis, you can get through anything. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, okay, so the reason I want to start with Ricky of the Year is because of this crazy piece of information that our gambling writer, yes. uh, David Purdom, tweeted uh, heading into the weekend. Um, and this is why... I know that there are a lot of Laker fans and there are some that I really respect who I think are really intelligent and um, I can have great discussions with them. A sense of butt coming, man. It's, it's hard to take average Laker fans seriously when I say the information that David yeah. Purdom is given out. Now, this is data that was given to David from BetMGM, which is not our official sports book here, which is, of course, ESPN Bet. How dare you even consider another sports book? But BetMGM, which is a significant sports book, obviously, says that there have been seven times as many bets on Bronny James to win Rookie of the Year as LeBron to win MVP. Now, I'm not arguing that you should put your money on LeBron to win MVP. But there's at least a my chance. Of, <laughs> I mean, there's at least a chance in hell. G League Rookie of the Year, maybe we can have a discussion. But anything else, like, and are these just like dollar bets, five dollar bets, just to get a ticket for a souvenir? I don't know. But if you're putting real money on Bronny James as the NBA Rookie of the Year, I mean, come on. You might go get a coffee. It. Go get a coffee instead of putting five dollars on that. You'll be a lot better off. Or a beer. Or a beer. yeah. Um, yeah, I, you're right. There could be just a bunch of people putting one dollar bets on it. By the way, McMahon, you have the ESPN bet numbers up there. What is, he's got to be on relatively high on the board. No, he's actually he's on the board. Just well, he's so, on the board. Just yeah. so people can put put down bets. But he is of the I don't know how many a bunch of rookies on here. He has the uh, longest odds at plus twenty five thousand. So okay, which means, that's why I, which I guess you I can bet hundred to win twenty five thousand for people who don't follow gambling. But yet. don't bet a hundred. Jeez. No. So your dollar would win what? I'm not good at math. Two fifty. Two hundred fifty bucks. Yeah. 
Still a bad bet. <laughs> ah, so it's 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 a novelty bet. It's not a real bet. I understand, but it's still okay. Um, Zach Eady has been the leader on this throughout the uh, on the board. By the way, twenty six. Okay, Zach Eady has been at the top of this along the uh, since summer league, and with the way he's looked in the preseason, McMahon, I see no reason why he shouldn't remain at the top. He uh, has played a significant role for the Grizzlies and had a couple of spectacular performances. Yeah, I mean, he's the heavy favorite, plus 275 versus next at plus 650. So, and, and it is both role and production for E. Uh, he had the huge preseason game. We actually came off the bench, which is interesting, um, against the Pacers, but played like 18 or 19 minutes and had 23 points, nine rebounds. I mean, you know, the guy's seven foot four, 290. Um, a back to the basket post school, you know, it's not even league, but has this little hook going right. And then I think it was Isaiah Jackson that was like overplaying him, trying to make sure he couldn't get to that hook. Quick drop step, thunderous dunk uh, to the other, you know, to left. Um, he was the number one guy, in, if it's just based on the numbers, on all those things by a long shot. And then on the actual boards, then you get into the debate of in the modern NBA, does this type of, you know, how does this type of player fit? You know, the, the challenges defensively, blah, blah, blah. But the guy's going to, he's going to get buckets in the NBA this year. And I'm not sure there's going to be a lot of rookies who are double figure scorers outside of uh, Zach Eady. The only slight pushback I'll get to that is that if you look at, if you go back to the models back in the spring, Reed Shepard was the guy who had the best analytical season, but Zach Eady had a monster past couple of years at Purdue. And like you said, the, the questions about him were not his ability to be productive. Like people, you know, he did score highly in the models. The, the only question was, how is he going to fit mm -hmm. in the modern league? And the fact he's dropped a bunch of weight and he's moving around the court pretty good. And it was Isaiah Jackson who he went around for that dunk the other day. And, you know, it, it's going to be, like we've talked about, a really fascinating thing in the the most interesting thing about this rookie class from this rookie of the year award is that you look at the other guys who are kind of in the mix for it. And there's not a lot of clear options to the kind of playing time that Zach Eadie's going to have to put up these numbers. Like Donovan Klingon had a huge game the other night. They've got DeAndre Ayton and potentially Robert Williams playing at center that could cut into his minutes. He'll probably play more, I'd assume. As yeah, he had a, yeah. The other night, um, they absolutely destroyed the Utah Jazz. I don't even know what the final of that game was. Um, it was a lot to a little. But uh, <laughs> yes, it was. But the the concerning thing for that game for the Jazz, although the reality is what it is, wow. is that the the Blazers didn't play a number of their front line guys, um, including DeAndre Ayton. So uh, Donovan Klingon started, and he had twenty rebounds in that game. Um, unfortunately for the Jazz, Walker Kessler started. Um, so well, the Jazz, um, the Jazz, I think, are finally going to be competing for a super high draft pick this year. So that that could be a potentially good thing for them. But if you go through a look at these guys, like Stephon Castle has had some moments in the preseason in San Antonio, but they've got Devin Vassell, they've got Chris Paul, they've got Trey Jones, they've got a lot of guys that are going to play at the guard spots that could eat into his minutes. If Reed Shepard was on another team, I think he'd be my pick to win rookie of the year. He's playing in Houston. They've got Jalen Green and Amen Thompson and obviously Fred Van Vliet. So his minutes are probably going to be down. The Wizards guys, Bob Carrington and Alex Saar are interesting. However, they have been uh, very bad as a team in the preseason. And even though that, those guys are going to have the ball a lot and play a lot, I'm not sure they're going to put up real numbers as super young guys playing on a team that has a chance to be the worst team in the league. Um, so you, like it's, it's just, it's, it's an atypical. Awesome. Yeah. Zachary Richeche, the first pick is again, like he's a young guy who's playing with Trey young and some of these other guys. And it's going to be kind of filling a role on the wing, but it's not going to be one of the top three options on his team. You know, they've got Bogdan Bogdanovich and Jalen Johnson and then Trey, obviously. So it's just an atypical rookie class and that, there's not a lot of guys who you can really pencil in for big minutes and also big production. And that's why Zach Eady checks a lot of boxes because he's seemingly got a really guaranteed big role on a team that could be really good. And he's also a guy who, at least in theory, has a chance to walk in the league and be productive. So he's certainly my pick for the award. 
Reed Shepard, by the way, was two of 11 on three-point shooting in the preseason. Now, I'm not... Don't worry about that. <laughs> I, I understand. I'm just just, just putting that in there. I was like, you know, if, if you're a Lakers fan, you're saying, well, why aren't you bringing up um, Dalton Connect, who had a 33-point game the other night um, <clears throat> against Phoenix? Um, or was it against the Warriors? I can't remember which one it was. Um it was, it was against, against it was against it was against Phoenix because they won it overtime. They won the war the they they lost the Warriors by about a billion. Let's yeah, I don't right. think the Lakers scored thirty three points as a team against the Warriors. <laughs> now that you mentioned, I didn't even see the results of that game. I just saw who was not playing and just turned it yeah. off in my brain. They lost by more than the Jazz did, I think. Yeah, I don't okay. think that was a ratings hit on our network. No. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it was well, the lowest rating Lakers. Look, don't Lakers don't Warriors. connect his. Dalton Kness got a chance to potentially play some minutes for the Lakers, but again, he's another guy that, you know, they've got LeBron, they've got Anthony Davis, they've got Rui Hachimura, they've got D'Angelo Russell, they've got Austin Reeves, they've got, like, you're talking about a guy who's going to be the sixth or seventh offensive option on his team. I know he plays for the Lakers, but it's going to be difficult for him to put up the kind of numbers that typically would have him be in candidate, a candidate to actually win that award. So, you know, yeah. But he has an older rookie who's got a chance to play minutes. And if he plays like this isn't a typical rookie class, like he could be in the mix for a first team all NBA or being on the rookie of the year bout if he just becomes a rotation player for the Lakers because there's not it's there's just not a ton of competition, at least as it stands right now, for those spots. But yes. listen, if we can do if we're gonna do small sample size preseason three point numbers, I think the rookie we'd have to talk about there would be Ryan Dunn. And I know you mentioned this, I think, on a, on a pod recently, Wendy, but this is a guy who is a total non-shooter at Virginia. What was the number of, of threes he hit in his career at Virginia? I believe he made 12 in his entire college career. And he went 13 of 30, which is 43% in the preseason. And he is he's a very interesting – he was a number 28 pick because he was such a non-shooter. If people thought, and I, well, JJ Reddick made a joke about if we'd have known he was a you know a forty percent three point shooter, our board would have looked a lot different. But if this guy can be an okay three point shooter, he might carve out a pretty significant role right away for a Suns team that could really use that multi positional defensive uh, weapon. And he is supposed to be a potentially elite type of defender. Um, again, small sample size, 13 of 30, but if he's an okay shooter, then he's got a chance to be very interesting. Plus 7,500 is, is where he is on the ESPN bet board. Not sure he'll put up rookie of the year numbers, but in terms of impact as a rookie, worth keeping an eye on. One more thing on Dalton Connect. He hit the eighth, I think he was eight of 13, um, in that game where he made all those threes, which obviously he's an, an elite shooter. JJ Redick, um, you know, basically said this guy is an absolutely elite shooter, and you know he knows he knows what one looks like. Um, he didn't shoot the ball great, other than that in the preseason. Um, so that's one thing. The only interesting thing I'm going to say, and it's kind of ridiculous to say it because he played two games, um, was the number one overall pick, whose actually odds I think have fallen a little bit. Um, when people have gotten a little bit of a look at him, but Zachary Rishishe, Zach, which uh, Z-A-C-C-H for all you who are going to be texting your buddies about him. Uh, Zach Rishishe looked pretty good. And yeah. now he, he played like 45 minutes total. So we are not talking about anything really to write home about, but he, one of the things that I thought really stood out because I watched him a little bit, was how much confidence he played with, um, which for a guy who is still super young and super slight, um, you know, he's going to have some rude awakenings in the physicality aspect. But um, if he can get real minutes, like the the challenge, as you guys have talked about it, winning rookie of the year is going to be getting regular minutes. Mm -hmm. And I think he's got a chance to get that with the Hawks. He, you know, he, he, I would not ignore, I put it this way. If you're going to make a, you know, toss away bet on a rookie of the year candidate based on what we've seen, I like Zach Richeche as a, in that spot, as opposed to Mr. James in, uh, in LA. 
Um, all right. You have odds up there for uh, defensive player of the year. Um, yeah. Wimby. Because it's going gonna, it's gonna to piss off Gobert. I know that. Well, yes, but at least it's his protege who – I don't know if protege. He's a guy he's known for a long, long time and thinks extremely highly of. Uh, Wimby is the overwhelming favorite here. Minus 160 means you got to bet 160 bucks to make 100. That's how much of a favorite Victor Wimbanyama is to win Defense Player of the Year after finishing his runner up his rookie year. Uh, Gobert is actually fifth among the odds at plus. I know. I I saw that. I saw he was. And I think what's the top five? Top five is Wimby, Bam Adebayo, Chet Holmgren, Evan Mobley, Cavs Corner. And Rudy Gobert. Uh, Adebayo and Holmgren plus 1,000. Mobley plus 1,200. Like I said, Gobert plus 1,500. You know, look, and the thing with Gobert, like, I just think the standard is so high, will be so high for him to win a fifth Defense Player of the Year award, a record-setting fifth. And there's always this backlash uh, against Gobert. You know, he got knocked out in the Western Conference Finals and had the best plus minus in the Western Conference playoffs. And people act like he had a terrible postseason. But there's, you know, obviously, look, Luca picked the Wolves apart. And so there's there's that thing. Um, you know, Luca put the, the game winner in his eye and shouting, you know, you can't effing guard me in effort. And, you know, all, all that. And he got benched for France. And, uh, you know, public perception has gone so strong once again against Gobert that, uh, a four-time defense player of the year who won it last year is, is fifth on the odds. And I think it's, like I said, I just, I just think that he would have to have his best defensive season by far to win the award. And the simple fact of the matter is this might be the first of many for, for Victor. Well, I will say this. So, I mean, we weren't tracking uh, odds like this because, um, you know, Futures betting on awards was, especially on Defensive Player of the Year, was so scattered, you know, 20 years ago. And I'm sure that if it wasn't minus 160 or whatever you said it was, when Ben Wallace was winning four in five years or when Dwight Howard won, I think, three in a row, it was probably somewhere in that in that zone. If you wanted to go put a bet on Dwight Howard to win Defensive Player of the Year in 2011, you, you would have gotten less than even money, whatever it is. I got to believe that this is a record in terms of odds for someone who's never won the award before. I yeah. can't believe we would ever, um, ever could have gotten this much belief that you would an award uh, yeah. when you hadn't won it. I mean, and I would say in any of the awards. And it, uh, and it doesn't feel I, look. I, I think it certainly makes a lot of sense to think Victor's going to win the award. I think in the new rule environment where you have this games limit on these awards, that's a pretty stark that's a that's too big of a gap in my opinion between him. There's and a big surprise, McMahon. Bon Temps is not on the Wembenyama train. No, no. I think he's the favorite to win it. But I, if you're talking about the fact that now there's a, a limit that can disqualify people from qualify for the award, him being minus one sixty and the next guy being plus a thousand, I just think that's a. What you're I don't saying think is it's not a good. I don't think it's a great value bet. That, right. That's I agree what with I'm that. saying. I just because there's like if, if there was no games limit, like yeah, I Victor has clearly got all the momentum coming into the year to win the award. And we all agree, we don't agree on how much better San Antonio is going to be. We all agree they're going to be better. And Victor is probably going to be making all kinds of highlight plays on defense. He's certainly yeah. going to be a, a top candidate for the award. It's just hard for me to put anybody as a minus for one of these awards when you could have one high ankle sprain and potentially be disqualified from being eligible to win it. That's all. But yeah, I mean, he, with the way last year went at the end, momentum coming into the season certainly feels like it's his award to lose. Well, and they have to, you know, they've got not the CP3 is anything close to the defensive player that he used to be. You know, he's a guy that you you've got to hide now, but he's at least, you know, he's going to be in the right places within the scheme. Like the, you know, the the vets that they bought in last year, the Spurs finished twenty first in defensive rating when Victor was on the floor. It was at a level that would have been fifth. It, it you know. They've got to at least be top half of the league, I think, 
to, you, you can't get if, a team can't be bottom ten in defense and and have a guy be defense player. You guys tough, but if he if he hits the game's limit, the guy's going to lead the league in blocks. I mean, he might block yeah. some shots this year, like you said, and he he, he gets a lot of steals too. Um, and some of the blocks he get like not just around the rim, but like his ability to get from the paint to swat a three point shot. I mean, some of the blocks he gets yeah. are ridiculous. He gets two shots that aren't possible for maybe anybody else in the league. And for and, and if you're looking at just the voting for the, the betting part of this, I don't really love any of those other guys as a, a strong number two either, right? Like Bam Adebayo is a super versatile defender, mm-hmm. but you know, there he's not the guy, he's not the kind of guy that makes a lot of flashy standout plays at that end. Evan Mobley's got Jared Allen next to him. We'll see where the Cavs wind up, but I think they kind of cancel each other out with that stuff. Rudy, as you mentioned, coming off last year's playoffs, I don't think he's going to have a ton of momentum coming into the year. So it, yeah, I think it's difficult to see who the – if it was like, hey, there's this one other person that you could point to as like a real rival. And Chet, same thing. Like their whole defense is really good. They're going to have Hartenstein out there for a good chunk of the year when he gets back from this hand injury. So from that standpoint, too, it's like if Victor stays healthy, there's a lot of reason to expect him to win the war, which is why he's obviously a big favorite. Oklahoma City is interesting because I think it's fairly likely that the Thunder have the number one defense in the league. And obviously, like the Wolves last year, were number one. There are four guys listed among the, I don't know how many, looking at it, call it 30-ish. Four Thunder players listed uh, among the odds here. You've got Chet, Caruso, Dort, and then Shea Gildas-Alexander, all listed. By the way, Shea's not there fourth best defense player is not their fifth he's maybe their sixth perhaps their seventh um but the if oklahoma city is like uh, way above and beyond the rest of the league that it will be interesting to see how that impacts uh defense player of the year voting yeah it's true especially if like you said the spurs are 20th or something this is in front of McMahon, so I won't ask him. Uh, Von Temps, who would you say, just if I was asking for your pick for preseason coach of the year, who would you say? Because it's kind of ridiculous. Of a, It's really sort of a bet on the on a team more than the coach. But who would you say should be at the top of the list? I mean, I don't know. I mean, this the, the coach of the year is basically whatever team surprises the most. So, like, I don't know. I mean, I. I don't have a great answer off the uh, top by the of way, my head. Maybe Kenny uh, Atkinson will win it because the Cavs okay. finished first or second in the East. I don't not know. A, not a terrible idea. Although the Cavs had a setback, Max Struess is going to be out for six weeks. The uh, really yeah, it's a big injury for the Cavs. Struess was coming back from a hip injury that had kept him out of some preseason games. He was doing an individual workout, and from what I understand, a coach was just you know, doing some shooting drills with him, and he came down. By the way, he's going to get reassessed in six weeks. So it's a – He's probably out till after Christmas. I don't know about that, but it's a – It's six weeks from now is the beginning is early December. He's probably not coming back six weeks from now. Well, I don't don't want to make that assessment, but I would just say that – At least in the range of Christmas, it seems like it's likely to expect him to be back, which is a long long time. Remember how two years ago Durant – like missed like multiple weeks because he just landed on his foot weird on his warm up. This is, this is not quite the same because the coach was just doing a shooting drill. And from what I understand, Max just came down on the coach's foot. Like it was sucks terrible. Um, And it's a bad sprain. You know, I I don't know whether it's a, I mean, it's obviously at least a grade two. If you're missing, if you're out for six weeks, it's a grade two, at least minimum reassessed in six weeks. As we talk about all the time, this means he's likely coming back after that. All right, so um, not Kenny Atkinson. Um, Ime Udoka was at the lead, was at the head of this um, coming into the season. Uh, McMahon is Udoka still is it, is he number one in ESPN bet now or is it Tibbs? He's not. He's number two at plus eight seventy five. Number one is Tibbs. Plus so I, th- I think at the beginning of the season, beginning of the whatever, when <clears throat> training camps open, I think Udoka was at the top of a lot of lists. And I think after watching the Knicks 
were they four and one in the preseason? Um, and maybe it was a little bit of a lag from the town's trade or whatever. But um, Tibbs has replaced Yudoka. Um, yeah, and that's so interesting because I agree. I don't. I wouldn't. I wouldn't even have used this. I would have just skipped Coach of the Year. But I thought that there was movement. For there was movement in the favorite. I think is interesting in the markets. Yeah, and there's like the Knicks come into the season with pretty high expectations and. Basically, like you said, coach of the year tends to be overachieving team of the year type of thing, right? You know who should win coach of the year this year, by the way, is Joe Missoula. Well, that's he what I was going to say. Each of the last two years, and I thought he won it two years ago, and he didn't. I mean, I shouldn't say he should have won it last year. He easily could have won it each of the last two years. Mark Daniel was a deserving winner last year. He hasn't won the award yet. The, the Celtics certainly look like they're going to be awesome again. They win 60 games again. I would expect I, I certainly would have him ahead of Tibbs in the voting, the coach of the year. Well, he's up there, right, McMahon? He's like in the top three. Yeah, four. he's he's fourth plus twelve hundred. I'll I'll give you the top five. Tibbs, Ime, Chris Finch plus one thousand, Mazzola and Jenkins, Taylor Jenkins and Memphis are both both plus twelve hundred. You know, Taylor Jenkins, that that's a pretty interesting situation. His coaching staff has completely turned over. In the last couple of years, the the two holdovers the last year, well, the two holdovers from last year's staff have both only been there one year, right. and you know they they brought in. I, I'm going to botch the guy's name, so I, I'll just say this. Uh, you know, highly thought of young offensive mind from Paris Basket. You know, considered one of the sharpest offensive minds in Europe, and they're they're putting in and brought him in as a lead assistant, putting him in as the. Uh, or putting his system in offensively. And it's it's a interesting situation given all of that. And the Grizzlies were a 27-win team that everything went wrong last year. But there's this anticipation that there's this big bounce back from them this year. And, you know, I mean, it's certainly possible. But if you look at the Western Conference, I, I like the assumption that, that they bounce right back to – you know, a top two or three spot. Well, that, that's, I think that's the key. I think they're going to bounce back, obviously, but bounce yeah. back to where? Bounce back to second? Well, then Taylor Jenkins should get it. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I mean, a lot of, that's the thing about coach of the year. So much of this just ends up becoming the narrative around whatever team surprises people during the year, which is why, like, I think Eric Spolstra has never won the award, I if know, I remember correctly, which that's is, true. and he's one of the best coaches of all time. So, like, again, it's very, it's impossible to make any kind of prediction on that. I kind of had a, uh, I, you know, I, I've, I've kind of been on that um, train for a while and I kind of sort of had a standing rule that I was, Eric Spolter was going to be on my ballot no matter what until further notice. And I had him, I've had him second some years. I've had him third. I don't think I've ever voted for him. Even when he, even when the heater in the play in. Uh, so last year um, I couldn't do it uh, as yeah. my thing is that last I year mean, they had coach, but that that's, yeah, you know, but I but like for years I was like um um I was like you know he's underrated and even if he's not going to win it I'm always going to have him on the ballot and uh, last year I couldn't do it yeah. I couldn't do it last year by the way Missoula finished fourth last year um he finished third two years ago two years ago Mike Brown won the award um unanimously I mean the Kings hadn't been to the playoffs yeah. in uh, 17 years and they were like the three seed so um you certainly could but um but you're right Bon Temps like um there's no doubt that you know. That Missoula has not gotten appropriate recognition well, he's got for the, how well he's, he's done. Got the TMT problem for this award. Too much talent. Yeah. You know? <laughs> well, and also, and look, from the beginning, he because I mean, look, Joe's also an interesting dude. And and because of that, people I think have sort of unfairly maligned him at different points over the last couple of years. And all the guy's done is won like 80% of his games since he got the job. Well, so. And honestly, his first year, there was even talk midway through the season. Right? It took him a while to even get the interim tag removed. And there was there was talk about like, maybe this is a temporary thing, which obviously ended up being... Well, I'm not so sure they knew what was going to happen. They, they were <clears throat> they were in a stress situation. They put yeah. him in the job. Like, you know, they've tried to support him as much as they could, but I think, you know, privately they were like, let's see how this goes. Yeah. Um, yeah and he went out and won 57 games that year. Like he, and right. I, th I think if they win 60 plus again and they look awesome or if they're, if they're tops in the East, it, it he's going to get a lot of votes and shit. But well, again, the, the coach of the year is the one of these awards that like trying to bet on it now is a fool's errand. 
Well, but I would say it's it's just interesting to see, like, you know, we haven't talked about Udoka at all, but obviously the the people who are looking at this feel like the Rockets are going to make a big improvement. You know, they're basically yeah. they're basically saying that they're, this is sort of a bet on the Rockets being the surprise Yeah, if the Rockets team. make the playoffs, that's exactly the kind of guy like a Mike Brown, like yeah. you said, one or two years ago. That's the exact formula of somebody winning the award. Yeah, well, but like last special. year, the Celtics, I know Porzingis missed <clears throat> some time, but they also didn't have much – injury you know they were just no, so far out, they were so yeah. far ahead the whole year they just sort of were operating in a in a zone all by themselves even in the playoffs yeah they kind of like were not even in the national consciousness for the but, first month of the playoffs because they were just bashing everybody in and just waiting back yeah like that's that's an indication of, of everything everybody doing their job really really well which is what this is supposed to be yeah. um, but listen if the rockets make the playoffs which Ime Udoka came out on media day very strongly said that's the goal. It's where we should be. I'm like, wow, that's uh that's bold. If they accomplish that, then 100 percent he ought to be. Yeah, he's gonna high. be right there. Uh obviously they made a huge leap last year to become a 500 team. If they can make the playoffs in the West, he absolutely deserves it. Mike Budenholzer's interest in it plus 1500. I will say again, I thought that Frank Vogel, uh, who by the way is now consulting for Jay Kidd with the Mavericks. Uh, I thought he got way too much blame last year. Way too much blame. But yeah. if the if the Suns um, are the type of team that people thought they could have been last year, then Boonholzer is going to get a lot of credit. Jason sure. Kidd was uh, on uh, Frank Vogel's staff when they won the title with the Lakers. Yeah. So that's where that connection is. Um, uh, okay. MVP. Uh-oh. Um, this will only be discussed on four to 12 pods in the next six months. Um, or at least be discussed on three of them. That's true. That's true. Yeah, you don't do a preseason poll, Bontemps. Maybe you should rethink that. Um, I've been, this has been brought up to me, and my response is the same every time, which is I, it's hard enough to do three of them. I don't want to do a fourth one. So. Hey, pal. Hey, pal. <laughs> uh, you want the top five here? Yeah, so not every. I'm not sure every book has the same leader, but uh, let's hear ESPN. It's got to be the same top four for everybody. Okay. Well, I'm not sure the order is the same though. It's awfully close right. at the top. Luka Doncic plus three seventy five. Shea Gildas Alexander plus four hundred. Nikola Jokic, winner of three of the last four, plus four sixty. Giannis Antetokounmpo, uh, winner of two, but it seems like a while ago. Plus eight fifty and Ant Edwards plus nine hundred are the top five on ESPN bet. So there are other books that have Jokic as the leader. Um, close, close. Yeah. Um, and, and and again, for for Joker to win his fourth in five years, fair or not, I think the standard. I is should I shouldn't to... say other books. There's one that I've seen that has it, so I shouldn't. Well, and, and this is this I was going to ask you fellas a trivia question, which is if Jokic is to win a fourth MVP in five years, how many times has that happened and who did it? Uh, um, trivia. The Kareem? Well, LeBron oh. won four in five years. That's the one answer. Is okay. that the only one? Okay. Right. It's the only one. Kareem and was close. <clears throat> Russell was close. Nobody else has won it four out of five. And again, this should be the MVP of the 2024-25 season, and that's what you're evaluating on. But I think we all understand that history and narrative and all that stuff does creep into this. So I think Joker will have to be far and away the clear, convincing uh you know, candidate here, which last year ended up being the case. Um, we'll see if that happens again. Um, you know, the SGA thing is, and again, we're, we're just assuming health, knocking on wood for for all these guys. Yep. The SGA thing is the guy's going to, you know, average probably 30 points per game and seven or eight assists, bumping that up a little bit from last year. They're going to be a team that's probably top three, at least top five on both ends of the floor. And they're going to win 50 some odd, maybe even 60 games. You know, I think Luca's case, he, 
you know, Luka is going to put up the numbers. Um, are the Mavericks going to win enough games to get him to the top of the list? Um, and kind of the timing matters a little bit too, because the Mavericks made a late charge last year to where, you know, that's, that's exactly right. That's the, that to me, that's the thing. Like, I think if you re-voted for MVP <clears throat> at the end of the finals, Luca would have had a good chance to win it. Well, yeah, except that the the voting is done at the end of the regular I season. I understand, but it's and done Luka, by, it's done the, by the humans. Bigger, the reason the that, big... that Jokic won it last year was because of how awesome he was the year before. He had, Correct. He had, he, that, he, that's when the narrative gets set. It's not, it's not in March or like when the season's ending or even at the beginning of the season. It's the season before. And last year, what was the story right now? It was the Mavs are coming off tanking to get Derek yeah. Lively. Mm -hmm. And the Nuggets were coming into the season having won the title. And Jokic breaking through, right? And like we talked about, you said it earlier. The narrative on this gets set early. It actually gets set the year before. And one of those four guys who was at the top of the voting last year, Shea, Luka, Giannis, or Jokic, is going to win the award, barring something yeah. truly bizarre happen. And the pass to it, I mean, man laid out a couple of them. Shea's got a good chance to be on the best team, at least record-wise, and he's the best player on the team, and he's seen as a top four or five player already anyway. He was third. Luca finished second. He finished third, right? Oh, they were basically which, tied. Oh, the way no, around. no, Shea finished second. Yeah, which actually, right, that, so, that actually surprised me last year. But, yeah, Shea finished well, they, they were basically – it was a virtual tie yeah. for second, right? So, like, he and Luca come into the year as the two guys who are favored to win the award. We've talked all summer – about the ways that Denver's offseason was disappointing, at least to us, right? Mm -hmm. If the Nuggets finish first or second in the West, it's going to be because Jokic was awesome. And if they surprise everybody and finish first or second after losing KCP and everything else that's happened, he's going to have a ton of momentum. And then you've got Giannis, who had a monster season last year, became the first guy to ever, I think, average 30 in a season and shooting 60% or better from the field. But Milwaukee kind of disappointed. They obviously fired the coach. Halfway through the season, they had all this chaos with the team. If he comes back, is awesome this year, and the Bucks finish first or second in the East, it's going to be the same thing as Jokic, right? It's going to be Giannis has this resurgent season. Those are the paths for each of those four guys to win. Let me just say that I'm not sure there's almost anything that Giannis and Jokic could do this year to win this award. I just it, I just laid out I just laid out the past to both of them winning the award. I'm just telling you, and I'm saying realistically, I'm not sure that it's possible for them to win. It, it, it Unless seems the other guys had injuries and didn't hit the 65 game. I pressure. think it I think it's very possible if Minnesota and De if Min if Milwaukee and Denver are in the top two in their conferences, those guys are going to be right there to win the award. Well, but to Wendy's point, a tie or like if it's a tough decision probably goes to one of the guys who has yet to win it. Um, I don't disagree with that either, to be clear. But like, it, what I would say is I think there's very little chance of anybody other than those four guys winning the award. I wouldn't be betting on Ann Edwards. I wouldn't bet on Jalen Brunson. I wouldn't bet on any of these other guys. Just so you know, two years ago, the Bucs were the number one team in the league. Yeah. Giannis had a great season, and Embiid won it. The difference was, at that point, and Bede had been knocking on the door for a while. They were, I think, one or two wins ahead of the Sixers. They weren't far ahead. And they were expected to be awesome. And Bede had a heck of a campaign manager, a guy wearing a backwards <laughs> Mets cap right now. <laughs> okay. Relax. Relax. Um, I'm just I'm just saying this. <laughs> the Bucs at that point were expected to be a really good team. The Bucs this summer have been a complete afterthought. People are talking about them as finishing fourth or fifth or lower in the conference going into yeah. the season. It's a and, much and, different situation than two years ago. And, and in all honesty, the more I've thought about this, I think if you're trying to make a value bet, your best bet is Shea. Because I honestly don't see a scenario unless there's just injuries. Like, Do we honestly think that the Nuggets are going to win 65 games? No. Or the Bucks are going to win 65 games? I don't – I because these guys are past champions – and past multiple time MVP winners, and the bar is going to be so high for them. I think for them to win it is going to be, I think you're threading the eye of the needle, what they would have to do to win. 
Well, if, I, I mean, like I said, if Denver, if let's say Denver mm-hmm. does what they did last year, let's say they go 56 and 26. If they do that again after losing KCP and with all the drama around Jamal Murray and everything else that's happened, it's going to be because Jokic plays high so. 70s games and was awesome. I know, but he was awesome two years ago when they didn't win it because the bar was so high after he'd won two in a row. And, yeah. they, and they were coming off the disappointment. And they were I, supposed I'm, to be awesome. I'm just telling you, I think the bar is so high for Jokic and Giannis, it's almost unclearable, regardless of what they do. Again, if it's close, it's going to go to one of the other guys. And Shea's probably going to be on a team that wins a ton of games. He's going to Right. Play. And Shea has has higher odds than I than believe Shea has a higher I believe Shea has Damn. the highest floor. I believe Shea has the highest floor in this argument because his team should be the best. And he's really good, and he's seen as a guy who can win the award already. I think well, if Luca and the Mavs, I think if Luca and the Mavs are in the top three in the West, yeah. I think it's going to be very hard for Luca to lose because well, he's Luka sort is of the, in. Luca is the favorite. I'm saying yeah. I think the best value Just, bet is but it's, 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 it, it, He's the favorite by a whisker over there. Here. They are basically tied, and Luca's team has a lot more volatility. Like if you told me that the Mavs were sixth or seventh in the West this year, I could easily see it. With the way their team, like they're much closer to the middle of the pack in the West than the. What's top. the highest the Mavs have finished with Luca McMahon? And, and like this in past this year, right? Fourth. They've been a th- no, no, they were fifth last year. They've been a three seed. Okay. Uh, they played the Jazz and went to the Western Conference Finals. They What's were, the most wins that they've led the Luca has a Luca? And I know some of the years were shortened years. I mean, to, I'll look, look it up. I'll look it up right now. Come on, but the, getting to your point there. I think the knock, the biggest knock against Luca last year when the guy was leading the league in scoring, he was putting up triple doubles on a regular basis, averaging, you know, basically 34, 9, and 9, an unprecedented stat line. You know, Giannis had one, so did Luca. Um, the biggest knock was does he really drive winning? Does he really impact winning? And it's hard to it's hard to make that case after the guy uh just went to the finals, became the first guy ever. I'm honestly, when he was playing hurt the whole playoffs and went through a shooting slump, became the first guy ever to lead the entire postseason in points, rebounds, assists, and steals. I think the most important number for Luka's uh, MVP case is not going to be his points. It's not going to be his rebounds. It's not going to be his assists. Breaking news, he's going to average a bunch of all those things. It's going to be the Mavericks' defensive rating. Because, and not that voters will look that up, but if that number is in the upper half of the league, the Mavericks are going to win a ton of games. If they win a ton of games, I think he's going to be hard to hard to overlook. Yeah, I mean, listen, he is in, look, obviously I spent a lot of time keeping track of this during the year, right? And have over the years. He is in the position James Harden was in once upon a time, that Embiid was in a couple of years ago. He's sort of the guy who's due to win at some point, right? And so if there's a tie with anybody this year, Luke is probably going to win with any of these guys. But if he finishes, if they finish sixth or seventh in the West, I don't think he's going to win no matter what his stats are, because you're going to have Shea sitting there who's basically tied with them. And is probably going to be one of the top two teams in the West, which is your point, Brian. I do think if you're, if you're picking a bet here, say, I want to bet on one guy. I would bet on Shea because I think there's more paths to him winning because of how good his team is. But I think Luca, if it's tied with anybody else, he's the one who's going to win because he's seen as the guy coming off making the finals and everything else, who is going to be seen as quote unquote the next the most the next most deserving guy. I agree. If you win. repeated the statistical performances from last year, I think in the way you just laid it out, I do think Luca wins. I just want to point. I just want to bring you back to. Because I got the stat two years ago, Giannis averaged 31 points, 12 rebounds, six assists for a 58 win team and finished third. Yeah. Um, I believe Embiid I got, voted in, for him. Embiid, I voted I believe, for him the year before that. Uh, Embiid got 73 first place votes. Jokic got 15. Giannis got 12. It was close between second and third, but Jokic had more first place votes and more overall points. Yeah, I mean, so I'm, like, just, but I'm it, just saying like, the bar for Giannis, and now I'm going to put Jokic in that. Yeah. The bar for Jokic but the and difference, is so hard. So hard. Again, the difference between the Bucks then and the Bucks now is the Bucks then were expected to be awesome. And this year, the Bucks and Nuggets both are kind of afterthoughts because of where their teams sit. Fair and point. so 
If those guys have them at the top of their respective conferences, they're going to be at the top of the heap, and they're going to be right there. If they right. finish fourth or fifth, they. what I would say is there's no statistical path that Jokic or Giannis could take to finish fourth or fifth in their conference and win MVP. That's what I would say. Okay. What about the path for Ann Edwards? I don't think there is one. I I mean – well, using your Wolves same team. logic, what happens the if the, the what happens if the team. Wolves are the number one team and that their their trade works and their team is more balanced and they have a healthy? I team? guess if if you tell me that the the Wolves become last year's Celtics, I guess that's the way Anthony Edwards wins. Well, and, but I and, I think it's going to be hard for him to truly leapfrog all those guys. Yeah, I think the Wolves would have to be a number one seed in the West. Um, you know, a part of a big Which they almost big, were last year. A big part of his case is he would be arguably the best two-way player among the uh, MVP candidates. The only reason I say arguably is because Giannis has obviously been a defensive player of the year. Um, but he's not going to put up the numbers that Luke is or that Shea is. Um, so it's going to winning would have to be the driving force, I think, of an Ant case. And like, look, Ant is Ant is awesome. Ant's not going to have a like unless it. He makes huge strides. If you just look at the nerdy numbers, Ant's not going to have a case. Well, even forget the non-nerdy numbers. Ant's awesome. We all love Ant, right? He's a great player. Last year, he averaged 23, 5, and 4. He shot 44.5% from the field. He shot 35% from three. Like, you compare that to these other guys, it's not even in the same universe as those yeah. guys, statistically. Luke and, Luke and Shea are both going to put up 30-plus. Giannis might also. And while stuff in the box, you know, all those guys stuff the box score in all the other ways. Like Sorry, it's going that- to, to make a case for Ant if both Shea and Luca and, for that matter, Giannis and Joker are all averaging more points, rebounds, and assists. It's it's. Tough. I read, I, I think, I read I the wrong Ant stat has- line. Just just to just to back up, I read the wrong stat line. Just to be clear, but even last year, we had his best year yet when he finished seventh in MVP, and they were at the top of the West. He averaged 26, 5, and 5 and shot 46% from the field and 35% from three. Now, I will say Again, this. Great season, but it's not well, the same as these other Here's guys. what Ann has going for him. He has two things going for him. And I'm not arguing he's going to win, just so you just be clear. One, his team has the potential to be the number one seed. That's there. Yep. Two, he doesn't miss games, knock on wood. Three, he miss games. three he's ascending. In other words, the numbers yeah. you just – I think you just read his last two season numbers. Is that correct? If, I, I accidentally read his career stats first, okay. and then I read his last year stats. Point is – But numbers, his last two years, they've been going up for sure. Yes. Like he – he you know, I've talked about how he's still learning the game. He's still learning how to read the, the sheet music. And it wouldn't it wouldn't shock anybody if, if Ant's numbers tick up across the board. He's still a, a young, ascending, improving – I would say month by month, even player. I just would say it's probably a year or two early. Um, if you're if you're trying to bet on him winning it, I would say it's probably you're probably talking more like the 27 MVP than the 25 MVP. Because again, you got well Shea and Lucas sitting here, and you still got Jokic and Giannis sitting here. It's going to be hard to break into that top four. That's very true. But like I said, uh, if you look at the top five, and I believe. That the bar, the bar for for uh, Ant to clear is significantly lower than Giannis and and Jokic. You agree with that? And you look at the fact that these other guys have sometimes missed some games. That's the pathway I think that you could get there. I don't I think don't, that's going to happen. I just don't. I just don't think it's actually lower though. I do. All right, we can. He I was do. miles and behind. Way, he was miles behind those guys last year. Still. So. And by the way, right, but if he was the number one seed, it would be a different story. Plus, I, he announced was, himself to the world last year with their playoffs. It, it was down to the last day of the season, I think, for as far as the number one seed went last year for them. But um, we didn't mention him be because he's not playing 65 games. He basically has announced that. Yeah, so. I mean, he's he's made it he's made it clear. I'd be stunned if he plays 65 games. And and that, yeah, I mean, that's also going to be a factor here for this award just going forward. Like it, it makes it difficult to really handicap it. But like I said, I wouldn't bet on anybody past the first four guys. Yeah. All right. And, and, uh, and his fifth. All right. Have we forgotten any awards that we care uh, about? What else? 
I mean, most improved player, we don't want to do uh, that. Sixth <laughs> man, that's just where this touch is. It's too bad for me. Yeah. Um, all right, we, we kind of have a we have a we have a big week coming up. Obviously, the first few days are pre-programmed with uh, big games. The NBA does it. Is there a game you guys are looking forward to? Obviously, we got a long way to go, but is there a game that you guys are making sure you want to see this week? I mean, I'm looking forward to seeing the first two games in person. I'm going to see the Celtics and Knicks on ring night. Let's see what this new look Knicks team looks like against Boston. Obviously it'll be, I mean, I've covered the league for a long time. I haven't seen a Celtics ring night. That'll be an interesting thing to see. Banner 18 going on the rafters. Um, you know, we haven't really talked about it. One of the sort of interesting underlying stories of the preseason has been that Mikael Bridges appears to have tinkered with his jump shot and he went 0 for 10 from three on Friday night in the final preseason game. And he's two for 19 from three this summer or this preseason and his shot looks funky, and I'm very curious to see how that goes as we get into the season, if that becomes something to really monitor, particularly for a Knicks team that doesn't have a lot of depth. Um, well, and let me toss Wednesday, something else on there on, on the Knicks just before you move away. Yeah, for, no, for sure. Josh Hart had a very difficult in, uh, preseason where he basically admitted that he doesn't know what his role is. He scored yeah. two points in the entire preseason. And I think he even floated the idea, maybe I need to come off the bench um, because his role, which took a while for him to figure out last year. I mean, the Knicks from start to finish last year were a vastly different team, but Josh Hart didn't have a great preseason. Not that Josh Hart's performance offensively is vital to the Knicks, but the Knicks experienced some, you know, for all this excitement about everything, like, the Knicks had some have some some edges to to smooth out here. Coming and out. they've got massive pressure on them now after these deals. Like this isn't you know that like if they come into this year with the same team they had last year, I think it would be kind of a kumbaya feeling around the team. They had this great run. There we'll see what they do again this year, and then they'll sort it out. Now after putting their foot down and making these trades, they got as much pressure on the team in the league. They're coming into the season with all sorts of expectations now, and you know we're going to see it right off the bat. They play. Uh, they play Boston on Tuesday and then they host Indiana on Friday, a team they lost to in the second round of the playoffs. Like we're going to get a quick taste of just where this team is at. And then on Wednesday, you got the Sixers Bucks game. Obviously we just talked a bunch about the Bucks. They come into the season, you know, a lot of pressure on them to be good. Giannis, obviously his future potentially up in the air, depending on what happens this season. Um, and then the Sixers, Paul George going to play. We'll see. I would I would guess it's more likely than not he isn't available, but certainly not decided yet. And they haven't officially said one way or the other whether Joel Amita is going to play. I think he's going to play, if I had to guess, on Wednesday. But he hasn't played in the preseason. There hasn't been an official update. So, you know, I mean, I'll if probably Embiid be... doesn't play, can we flex out of that game if Embiid doesn't play? My <laughs> I don't know what well, else. We'd... I'll tell you what. I my uh, it's only one game, but my. Everything I've said about Philly, if Joel Embiid is not ready to play to start the year after this ramp up plan, I, you immediately the 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 panic meter goes to eleven. Well, can I, can I just ask a question on on Joel? Yes, he didn't get hurt right between the Olympics and now. It's my understanding. To, to our knowledge, he's, he's he is not hurt. No. Which okay, is so this is why this, I assume he's going to be playing on Wednesday. Right. So, I mean, to, to our knowledge, he didn't get hurt. So, this has all been load management slash ramping up slash whatever. Like, like I think that's just an, in, important to it's to important point to out. say. Yes, and like last year, he played one preseason game at the end of the preseason and did basically the same thing. Up, but other than that, like just ramping up for the start of the year, getting himself ready to go. Like I said, he. He looks great from a body standpoint. Losses has lost a bunch of weight. Everything I've heard, it seems like when he's been on the court, it's looked good. But you know, my he guess made- is I'll be on the court on Wednesday night, and I'll be watching Joel work out at seven at six forty-five. Uh, I believe the game is a seven thirty tip. I'm going to double check right now. Joel comes out forty-five to fifty minutes for the game. Works out for ten or fifteen minutes, and then there's a thumbs up or thumbs down on him playing. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's a seven thirty game. My guess is at six forty five. He'll be on the court, 
about 7 p.m. Eastern time, we'll get a thumbs up that he's going to play. That's because yeah. just because in the case of Kawhi, he literally had a secret surgery in May, and like he's returning from surgery, which is which is laughable yes. by the way that he. I mean, when he showed up at Team USA, he was literally limping. Uh, they were man. like, when Team USA was like, Kawhi Leonard arrives, that he's limping. You're like, um. So in that case, there was actually a surgery. But I just want to point out that we don't know of an injury. Absolutely, to my knowledge, there is nothing that's okay. happened for that. That's Joel and B, there will be maximum drama. Okay. Fine. And, you know, fine. it is what it is. Well, and it also it also goes to the overall plan that they have put in place, which we've talked about a bunch, which is the goal is to try to get them to the end of the year healthy. Like, that's what they're trying to do. I'm more excited to watch the Bucks in that than the uh, than the Sixers, especially if yeah. Paul Richard isn't available. Um, Mc, you know, McMahon, last, you want to guess which game I'm looking forward to? Here's a hint. It's a game you're going to be at. Oh, yeah. I love the, the long, lean French. Luca, Luca v. Dallas. Phoenix. Oh, that one. I thought it was Luca v. or Luca v. Phoenix, the the one of my favorite oh, rivalries in the league. I'm assuming it's 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 uh, Mansoor Vinhurst's. Uh, of course, uh, it's Victor. Minyama. <laughs> Listen, the, the, the reunion of, of uh, old Michael Corleone writing me. It's going to be a <laughs> big one. That's hey. definitely something to celebrate. Hey. You know how many lobs Chris Paul has thrown in his career? How many lobs is he going to throw to Victor? Oh my heavens! No, I, I, and you—I've said everything to say about how competitive I think the Spurs are going to be this year. Not a playoff team, but good enough to get me fed on Bontemps' dime. Um, you know, and I'm excited about it for a lot of different reasons. By the way, Luca also opted out of preseason. He just like Embiid. Nursing a calf contusion, but uh, when things don't really count, Luke is not that interested. But he's he's cleared, he's good to go. You know, uh, he'll be he'll be out there. And I I will point out, uh, Victor's much uh, anticipated NBA debut last year. He was not the best rookie center on the court that night, and so that the Derek Live in the second versus Victor matchup is uh, going to be a lot of fun. Although the Mavericks have not come out and, and declared that yeah, can I, their starting center. Can I ask you a question about this? So the other night, I saw Daniel Gafford started. Mm -hmm. what, what are we doing here? The, it's Like I said, they have not declared. They have acknowledged that uh, Lively is likely to start more often than not. I think there's a couple things. One, I'm going to repeat again. What I, are we doing here? Yeah, if if there's ever like a Bond Temps, uh, you know, where you pull the string doll and he, that, that would be one of them. Hey, pal, what are we doing here? Hey, pal, what are we doing? <laughs> um, <laughs> Daniel but, Gafford is a very good player, yes. but Derek Lively needs to be starting for the maps. Like, I, come on, guys. I I would agree with that. Now, I'll also kind of present the the counterpoint to that. The Mavericks took off last year when Daniel Gafford replaced Derek Lively in the starting lineup. Now. What I would add is Derek Jones Jr. also returned to the starting lineup at that point. His on-ball defense was a much bigger factor. But when that move was made, they went 18-2 and two down the stretch to zoom out of the play-in to the number five seed. Off they go on a run to the final. So I think there is – both these guys are going to play heavy. You know, it's not like one guy's going to play 34, one guy's going to play 14. Sure. 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 Even, I would – wager that lively will be in the 26 ish range gafford 22 or so um with maybe maxi cleave also getting some time at center on some in some smaller lineups but one i think there's a sensitivity about making daniel gafford feel like he's been demoted because absolutely he's done nothing to deserve a demotion. They want to make sure he continues to feel valued. He is all those kind of things too. I think there is a little bit of not that there's been any questions whatsoever about Lively's work ethic. They've been thrilled with that from the second they drafted him to now. But you like keeping a carrot in front of the uh, the young fellow, the guy who's who's 20 years old, who's had a lot of success. Uh, I think fair to say unexpected this early in his career. Um, and then you know, look, both these guys like Lively only played 55 games last year, you know, so they're going to need Gafford to start a fair amount, anyways. But 
when you when you talk to people like everybody's in full agreement that the significantly higher ceiling between the two centers is obviously Lively's. Uh, David Gafford's a really good player. That was a, a the, he is a perfect one two combo for them. They, it's one of the, I mean, you saw the Knicks last year. Like Derek's probably got a higher ceiling than even than Isaiah Hartenstein does long term. But like you saw the Knicks when they had Mitchell Robinson, Isaiah Hartenstein healthy, playing those guys for 48 minutes of high level center play. With, same with Dallas. It's a huge advantage. So like I'm not saying he shouldn't play, but start Derek Lively, Dallas. Come on. Like let's, Let's start the number 10 pick in the draft and like a guy who we talked about is one of the stars they, of the playoffs last year. I don't year. think they should start Casey Wallace at center. Oh, that's Ooh. right. Sorry. It's the 12th I mean, pick. I forgot they forgot they, they traded they back. They, they traded back from 10. That's All right. right. Uh, McMahon, what game are you looking forward to? Oh, that one is certainly high on the list. And and then, you know, like I said, I'm more excited to watch Bucks than Sixers necessarily. I am extremely intrigued by a supposedly more comfortable Dame. Um, we did not see the Damian Lillard that we that we saw for years last year. And again, you, you've mentioned it. The Bucks are kind of an afterthought now. I I think that's a strong assumption uh, to to think that they can't be a factor in the Eastern Conference. And so that that Dame Giannis thing, uh, Doc with a full training camp. You know, Doc, without as many excuses, I'm, I'm, I'm really the the Bucks are one to me one of the most intriguing teams in the league. So I, I love the fact that they've got a uh, a prime time showcase game right out of the gate. Hundred percent. And I want to see Chris Middleton too, coming off these two injuries. Like when the, when they had Chris Middleton, Dame, and Giannis last year, they looked like a really good team. They didn't have that very often. So let's see what version of Chris Middleton they get too. Because again, if they can get. They're in the same boat as the Knicks and the Sixers. If those four guys, those three guys at Brook Lopez, are healthy and effective when they get to April 15th, they're going to be a handful for anybody to play in the playoffs. Yeah. And like, you know, let's the other, see what they look like. The other game, um, and I'm, I'll have to go back and watch this one because it's right after Mavs Spurs that I'm covering, but uh, Thunder at Nuggets on TNT Thursday night, you know, Jamal Murray, you know, struggling the playoffs. Worst struggle in, in the Olympics. You know, knee's been feeling a little bit funny. Well, sir, here you go. You get to open up against Alex Caruso and Lou Dort and Case and Wallace. Um, and I, I, you know, we've talked a lot about the Nuggets. Interested to see that. Unfortunately, we won't get to see for right off the bat or for a while. Kind of the Hartenstein, Holmgren. How much of that is a combo? How much of that is a tag team? What's all that look like? But you know, I'm going to be spending a lot of time around uh, the Thunder this year, probably as much time around them as any team ever. I have 35. Oh, wait a minute. No, he's not going to do that. No, I just, I just, it's just a <laughs> little, little skip, little skip, a, a jump stop over the Red River for me. <laughs> on, uh, By the way, you want to talk about an unfortunate way to start the season? The Washington Wizards open their season on Thursday night at home against Boston. I mean, that's a difficult, that's a difficult way to start your season. If you're the it will be, there will be a lot of difficult. I, I understand that. I understand that. But that is a particularly I actually, difficult way to start the season. It, it's a it's a rough sales game because, you know, you're always going to get a good crowd for the champs. You're going to get a good crowd typically for opening night, and you're going to get a good crowd for the champs. And, you know, when, like, the Lakers come in. And for Boston. Yeah. So I'm like, you know, if I was if I was Wizard Sales, I'd be like, you know, how about we play, you know, Detroit on opening night and we get Boston, you know, in mid-December when we could use a yeah, uh, crowd. Right. Um, all right. Well, we'll be with you the whole way. This will be the only time we talk about the MVP the entire season, right, Jackson? <laughs> uh, all right. Thanks for uh, surviving the off season with us here at the Hoop Collective. Uh, next time we talk to you, we'll have games to talk about on Wednesday, and uh, won't have to worry about Bon Temps and McMahon. Uh, just kidding. Uh, <laughs> thank you for watching us in the Hoop Collective. We'll talk to you after the start of the new year. Adios, amigos.